I'm here to explain about something that's discussed every day. Our addiction to oil and our vulnerability to it and why we're still addicted to oil. In the process, uh, I'm, going to answer, I'm going to lay out the facts going back some 65,000 years of oil usage and um, uh, then, then answer any questions that you may have about any of the information you've heard about oil, about transportation, alternative fuel, et cetera. I will say that just about everything you have heard from big media, big and small government, and big corporations about oil, energy independence, fuel, transportation, is either an outright lie, a complete exaggeration, or a huge distraction. I'm going to lay out the facts. I'll tell you how I assembled this information. I, in, I uh, uh, gathered an international team of researchers. We accessed, in the tradition of my other books, IBM and the Holocaust, um, uh, Banking on Baghdad, War Against the Weak. All these books, by the way, are available up there, th courtesy of Barnes & Noble. And uh, I'll autograph them when we're done. And uh, I was the first one to get into the archives of British Petroleum, Turkish Petroleum, Anglo-Iranian, Anglo-Iraqi oil, parts of Shell, Henry Ford's undiscovered papers, Thomas Edison's undiscovered papers, And I began to understand, everybody can hear, that our country never needed to be addicted to oil. We never needed to have 98% of all transportation dependent upon petroleum. So everybody here is a college student, so let's ask some questions. What was the first fuel? Anybody know? In civilization, what do you think it was? Pardon me? Wood. You read the book? <laughs> That's right, it was wood. Now, oil itself goes back 65,000 years. I see there's a guy looking at me trying to understand how we can, how we can have 65,000 years when uh, 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 civilized society is only about seven to 8,000 years old. Uh, the uh, cavemen of Blumbas were using the black stuff that came out of the uh, rocks, petra meaning rock, oleum meaning oil, the petroleum as illumination, also uh, to make boats and for medicinal purposes. The first fuel was wood. Wood was the most precious commodity on earth. Why was wood the most precious commodity? More valuable than gold? Because without wood, there was no gold, no smelting, no metals, no iron, no coins, no jewelry, no weapons, no metal tools. And so consequently, when the great invaders of the ancient world conquered, they didn't conquer vast tracts of land for the mere size, as uh, say the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia, of, of, Arab of the Arabian Peninsula, they conquered places which had wood. Now I'll give you an example. And I've examined the contracts for wood going back to the ancient pharaohs. Um, anybody here know what the word Cyprus means? Anybody know what Cyprus means? What does Cyprus mean? The island Cyprus. What's it named for? Okay. The island of Cyprus. Cyprus means copper. There were originally huge forests all over Cyprus, and they were denuded for copper. 
In fact, some of, uh, in fact, I think the famous cedars of Lebanon were also denuded in large part for uh, smelting purposes. Consequently, when it came time to, de to determining exactly what was the most valuable commodity in the world, it was always wood. Now, let's fast forward to medieval times. Anybody in this room know why Robin Hood was hiding in the forest? Anybody know? Medieval times, it was illegal to use wood. The king owned all the wood, and peasants or common people could not cook with it. They could not build uh, their houses with it. They could not make furniture with it. It was illegal, and the penalty for using wood was death. Now, everyone here has probably heard of English civil law, but no one here has heard of English forest law. There was a parallel set of laws and a parallel court system for violating the forest laws and using wood. And that's why Robin Hood, who was a mythical character, was always hiding in the forest. He embodied the popular rebellion against uh, the, um, uh, the king to use wood. Now, even after the Magna Carta, wood was still the most valuable property in, of possession in England. And even the Magna Carta only changed the punishment to blinding and castration for using wood. England has got navies. They've got beer. They've got baking. They've got uh, uh, housing. They've got armies. They've got wagons. And pretty soon, there was a huge timber shortage. And that led to the world's first alternative fuel. Who knows what that fuel was? Coal, correct. Coal was the black, dirty, sooty, cancerous gunk from pits. And it caused haze and disease and respiratory ail ailments so much that in the 1600s, the first environmental movement started. They protested the use of coal. You could only do it in certain areas. There were laws against it, and there was a coal monopoly. And this monopoly is described in no book in Binghamton University. The name of that monopoly, this cartel, this secret cartel, first fuel car cartel, was the hostman of Newcastle. The hostman of Newcastle had a monopoly on British coal. And what was the basis of their monopoly? Did they mine it? No. Did they sell it? No. They transported it down boat, uh, on boats down the river. And so, you could have all the coal in England, but if you couldn't get it across the Thames in the 1600s, you would starve and freeze in winter. And that has its parallel to today. You could have all the oil in the Middle East, but if it can't get through the Strait of Hormuz, our society will come to a grinding stop. Ironically, every time the people rebelled against the coal cartel, the price of coal would go down after the election, and after uh, the protests subsided, the price would go right back up. Now, because the coal had to, was in wet mines, they developed an engine, a big machine, to pull out the water. What was that machine called? Anybody know? Pardon me? Steam, steam engine, correct. Then they put the steam engine on wheels. And what'd they call that? Pardon me? A train. And trains changed mankind. 
trains opened up the vast, empty, non-coastal air, areas, non-river uh, areas in England, in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, and even in America. And trains did something else. Trains made it possible for the first time for man to experience speed. Until trains, man could only go 5 to 15 miles an hour, either walking or on a horse. With trains, a man could stand in the wind on a train and go 60, 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. It changed man in a kind of a neurological way. If you're ever in a speeding train and you look out the sides, all you see is a blur. You can only see straight ahead. And since man encountered velocity, he has never been able to lose his fixation for where he's going without understanding where he has been. Now the vast open railroad track systems that, uh, um, that crisscrossed Europe, uh, Africa, England, America, they need a means of communication. Anybody know what that means was called? Who said telegraph? Correct, telegraph. How was the telegraph powered? Electricity, where'd that come from? Coal, nope. Steam, nope. Water, nope. Middle of the desert, nope. Know the mountains? No. Nope. Where'd it come from? Wind. Pardon me? Wind? Wind? No. Nope. We're talking about around the time of the Civil War. Where'd that come from? Batteries. Who discovered electricity? Anybody know? Who? Who discovered electricity? Voltaire. Voltaire? No. Who discovered electricity? Voltaire? No, I mean Volta. Who, who discovered elect electricity? Franklin. Franklin? No, he just flew a kite. Who discovered electricity? The ancient Greeks. What does the word electricity mean? Amber. There are three types of electricity. Static electricity from rubbing two things together that create a discharge. And that's what they observed when they, saw, uh, when they rubbed stones to, together. Natural electricity, which is lightning, which is what Ben Franklin had captured when he flew a kite, and generated electricity, which is what Thomas Edison did when he, when, when he, put, uh, engine, uh, when he put turbines to, together to generate the electricity. Now, there was an idea to put the electricity in a box and remove it from the source. And that, in the mid-1800s, was called wireless. Wireless electricity it has nothing to do with a Blackberry or anything else. They called it wireless. How does a battery work? Who knows? It's chemical energy, basically. It's chemical energy. It's two disparate Metals connected by an appropriate medium that causes a chemical reaction to give off a charge or discharge. Thank you very much. Thomas Edison, after spending a life with electricity, they asked him, how does it work? He said, I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows why these particles give off energy. So it's really a kind of a gift from God or from the universe that we're able to move objects, create work, create energy, create power based on nothing but molecules coming to, to together. Now, uh, when they were looking for this battery, uh, they originally were doing a, um, 
a, a, a vivisection on a frog. They saw a spark. They said, there's electricity in frog legs. Then they realized it wasn't the frog leg. It was the knife hitting the metal plate, the two separate types of electricity. From that, they developed the battery. And the batteries were very poorly made. They were taken over by major corporations. They, were, uh, uh, they had a lot of uh, fraud, speculation, um, lousy construction, broken promises, kind of like the computers we have today. And Thomas Edison actually said, anyone who gets involved with batteries is going to be a thief. But eventually, they got the batteries to work. And they put the batteries on a horseless carriage, and they made the first automobile. It was an electric car. When was the electric car first introduced to the United States? Anybody know? Who wants to guess? What do you say? 1881. Why do you say that? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah, earlier. Who else has got an idea? 1835. Just want you to know that when the car comes and say we're still trying to figure this out, 1835. When was the hydrogen fuel cell invented? Anybody know? You've heard of hydrogen fuel cell, right? Space age. Yeah. yeah. How about 1838? There's a picture of it in the book Internal Combustion. This is old technology. Actually, all the trucks and all the automobiles in the United States, up and down the East Coast, the taxis, the delivery trucks going to the early, early first years of the 20th century were all electric vehicles. I heard a guy on television from Car and Driver saying, well, the hybrid has only been around for uh, about five or 10 years. The first hy hybrid was in 1901 when somebody said, hey, why do we take a little uh, a gasoline and add it to the electric car? Now, after the Civil War, there was a period of great expansion and great corporate monopoly and great corporate corruption. And there were trusts, monopolies, on all sorts of commodities. There was a cotton monopoly. There was a, a, a copper monop uh, monopoly, coal monopolies, oil monopolies. That's how Rockefeller uh, criminally made his fortune. And there was a bicycle monopoly. There was a guy in Hartford, Connecticut, who said no one in the United States can own a bicycle unless I say so. His name was Colonel Pope, Columbia Bicycle Company, and it was through patent litigation. He had the patent on a bicycle. It didn't matter if it was good or bad. So if there was some guy in uh, Provo, Utah, or some guy in uh, the middle of, uh, uh, of uh, upstate New York or anywhere else that wanted to make a bicycle or ride one or build, or build one, it could not be done without the permission of this guy. There were also battery monopolies. The bicycle monopoly got together with the battery monopoly to create a super monopoly for the purpose of making the electric car. And they called it the Electric Vehicle Company. We're not talking a bunch of whale lovers and tree huggers and green radicals and environmentalists. We're talking about the worst speculators and corruptors on Wall Street. Create a monopoly that no one could ride a bicycle, have a battery, or run an electric car unless they sold it to them or gave them a license. And the electric vehicle company was challenged by a bunch of guys in the internal combustion world 
in the first years of the 20th century, okay? There were some guys who said, we have the uh, uh, patent on internal combustion. You are, um, uh, we are the electric vehicle company and you are trying to build internal combustion. You're trying to build cars like the Cadillac, the Dodge, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to sue you and make it impossible for you to sell internal combustion machines unless you do business with us. And so to run an internal combustion machine at that time was a sign of independence, a sign of populism, a sign of rebellion. We don't want the electric vehicle because the electric vehicle was the fat cat car. They fought him in court and eventually, instead of fighting him, they joined him. And they created a super cartel called the Electric Vehicle Company in which they would control all the bicycles, uh, many of the trains, uh, the batteries, the electric cars, and the internal combustion machine. And they jointly decided to kill their own uh, clean running electric vehicle in favor of the internal combustion machine, which was noisier, smellier, and more expensive. These are the kinds of machines, the internal combustion machines you see in, an, in antique museums. Why did they do this? Well, believe it or not, the electric vehicle was considered a girly car. The internal combustion machine required um, uh, a big toolkit, a big muscular man to do the crank. It made a lot of smoke. It made a lot of noise. It broke down. It took a He-Man. And the electric car, one button, quiet, it went. In fact, um, there's a famous picture of, uh, of uh, um, um, uh, Ford and Edison with their electric cars. Uh, and uh, it, uh, these were two guys who first came out and said, men can do electric cars too. Anyway, all the, car, all the internal combustion machine manufacturers and the electric vehicle guys got together in this monopoly and they agreed to de-emphasize the electric car and do only the internal combustion machine and keep it expensive and keep it exclusive. Now there's a big issue involved. Not only was the electric car clean and quiet, it did not stink. Now why is that important? Why was it important that the electric car did not stink? Did not what? Stink. Stink? Yeah. Twelve million horses. All the streets, all the mills, all the farms, all the factories. You ever heard of the term horsepower? That's because there were actually horses. And in, New, there were, and in New York, these horses would drop dead at the side of the road. They would have to uh, heap them up into giant um, uh, uh, piles of dead carcasses, haul them off every day. That horse excrement flowing all over the streets. When it rained, uh, it was just like a horse muck all over the place. But they said, we'd rather have the internal combustion machine because it stinks, it smokes, it shake, rattles, and roll, but that means it's a better car. In fact, it's interesting. More men died of mosquito-borne uh, diseases in the Spanish American War than of combat wounds. Horses. OK. So there's one guy, one car maker, who refused to go along with this deal, who refused to go along with this monopoly. What was that guy's name? Anybody know? Stanley. Who? Stanley? Stanley? No, Henry Ford. Henry Ford said, I will make the Model T. No one can stop me. He, bought, he fought them bitterly in court for seven years. And 1911, 
He was vindicated in court. At that point, there was an explosion of internal combustion machines. And therefore, what was confined to, uh, it was a very cheap car, what was confined to the major byways of this country now went in every intersection, every farm, every subdivision, every suburb. And Henry Ford realized he had, won the war, he had won the battle but lost the war. But because his country that he tried to liberate for mobility had turned dirty and toxic. And he hatched a secret plan with his hero, Thomas Edison, to create an electric Model T. It's not written about in any of the, any, any of the standard uh, uh, textbooks on Henry Ford or Thomas Edison. Uh, it's written in my book, Internal Com Combustion. And the idea was to recharge these batteries, these cars and batteries, with windmills and with home generation. The year is 1912, 1911, 1913. Every time Henry Ford makes his battery ready to go, he ships it from New Jersey to Detroit. They install it, they say it doesn't work. He ships another one, it doesn't work again. He ships it again, over and over again, until finally Henry Ford said, they're rigging the testing. False engineering. So then he came up with an idea for a tamper-proof battery. At that point, in, 19, uh, uh, in, in uh, 1914, excuse me, uh, sh slightly before 1914, there was a mysterious fire at his facility, even though he had his own fireproof uh, um, structures, he had his own fire brigade and fire alarms, everything burned down in a mysterious fire like that. It was ruined, wiped out. At the end of his life, he said, I will start again. Then came World War I. The automobile was weaponized, turned into machine guns, uh, to machine gun uh, units, turned into tanks, turned into other forms of troop transport. And that was how the electric car was killed. Not in the 50s or the 60s. But it wasn't just the electric car. There were electric trolleys that crisscrossed the United States, 18 million boardings. People love the trolleys. Meet me in St. In St. Louis, hop on, hop off. But in 1935, a piece of legislation in the FDR administration called PUCA, Public Utility Company Holding Act, made it impossible for the criminal enterprises that owned the electrical companies to also own the local trolley system. They had to divest. What happened? Five uneducated bus drivers from Minnesota suddenly appeared to create a, a, a front company called National City Lines. They started buying up the trolleys, Galesburg, Illinois, uh, um, uh, Baltimore, uh, uh, Los Angeles, ultimately 40 different cities. They would buy up the trolleys, tear up the tracks, burn the trolleys in public, bond, in public bonfires, and replace them with oil-burning motor buses. Federal government finally investigated and found that this was a criminal conspiracy led by General Motors in association with, with uh, 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 Firestone Tires, Mack Truck, Phillips Petroleum, and Standard Oil. They were convicted. They appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And three branches of government said that GM was guilty of a criminal conspiracy to undermine transportation in this country. And they paid fines, $5,000. And the executives paid a $1 fine. They, took, they undermined transportation in 40 cities directly and scores more indirectly throughout the 30s and the early 40s. Now, what was GM doing overseas 
while they were destroying mass transit in the United States. Anybody know? Pardon me? Electric trains? No. They were motorizing the Nazis, preparing them to conquer Europe and to undertake the Holocaust. Germany had always been a place of profound automotive engineering and innovation, but they had no mass production of vehicles. Alfred Sloan went to Adolf Hitler and said, we want you to give us a monopoly of sorts, if you will, or the facility to mass produce vehicles. You'll take over Europe. We will, we will provide the trucks. You will, do, you will launch the Blitzkrieg, and we will give you the Blitz truck for the Blitzkrieg. We're going to restore your employment because the automobile is the keystone of, uh, of, uh, ec of economic uh, 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 prosperity. And once we do that, you're going to need oil. And once we do that, you're going to need something called an autobahn. And so General Motors, directly under the supervision of Alfred Sloan, created the Nazi version of Opel, which provided trucks and cars for the Blitzkrieg using secret interlocking directorates that protected their personal decisions in Detroit and, and New York. They even stationed the spare parts in the trucks along the Polish border in the days before the beginning of World War II on September 30th, 1933. 1939. And then they made the, JU8, or the JU-88 bomber and the torpedo warheads. So from land, sea, and air, General Motors, in conjunction with the Nazis, were able to wield a reign of terror upon humanity. Excuse me. But that's not the end of the story. We know we became addicted to oil, and now we can't get off. We've known for a generation, since 1970, at the first Arab oil boy, uh, embargo, that we were vulnerable to oil. And what was done by our government and the major corporations in response to that, Escalades, Navigators, Hummers. Now we're using more oil than ever. And if the oil is interrupted at the Strait of Hormuz, two mile wide navigable lanes in the, in the Persian Gulf, if the oil is, in, is interrupted, 40% of the seaborne oil will be stopped, 20% of the American su supply will be stopped, 20% of the global supply will be stopped, and we have no plan, no contingency plan. There's a plan for swine flu, there's a plan for a hurricane, there's a plan for a blizzard, there's a plan for everything you can think of, but there's no plan for an interruption of oil. And my book, The Plan, has recognized that no one is even discussing it. Obama's not discussing it. Um, uh, uh, McCain and the Republicans are not discussing it. The governors are not discuss discussing it. The Democrats, the Republicans, no one is discussing this. Not even quietly. So, I'll give you an example. How would you get to school? In, how would your teachers get to school? Has Binghamton University administration formulated a contingency plan in the event of an oil in, in, interruption? Has the state of New York, has the local newspaper discussed it? Has the local television station discussed it? Has the president discussed it? Barack Obama said he wanted 
to have a million plug-in hybrids on the road by 2015. Who cares? There's more than a million vehicles a month sold in this, in this country. Every month. There's approximately 240 million uh, motor vehicles right now. There will be 300 by 2015. Who would care if there's a million plug-ins in 2015? What does McCain want to do? McCain wanted to give a $300 million award for the first guy to do an electric battery that was invented 150 years ago and that was in mass production in the beginning of the 20th century. They just had a profound cash for clunkers program. I actually proposed cash for clunkers in my book, The Plan, but not to spend billions of dollars to replace an 18 mile per gallon car with a 19 mile per gallon car with a scrappage rate of 10 years to condemn this country to 10 more years of oil addiction. But to use that money for alternative fuels, electric vehicles, CNG, hydrogen, hybrids, Brazilian ethanol. There's no one solution. I know that you're sitting on a lot of CNG. You would love CNG cars. Honda is the only company in this country that makes a CNG car. And they have a quota of only 2,000 a year. Yet there are 20 million, if not more, in the world. And Iran is converting their gasoline uh, automobile fleet to CNG at the rate of 20% a year in the event we will have sanctions against them blocking their gasoline because Iran lacks gasoline. They have plenty of oil, but they have no refineries. Yet that's not what was done with cash for, clunk for clunkers. There was a hydrogen program. They gave it $5 million over a number of years. That's nothing. Electric vehicles, that's old technology. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to unbury it from where it was put in the ground more than a century ago. In the event of an oil interruption, we have a 57-day strategic petroleum reserve supply of unrefined oil. We use approximately 20 million barrels a day. If we lose just one million barrels a day, they're going to open the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. If we, that's just 5%. If we lose 1.5 million barrels a day, they're going to ask Poland and New Zealand and Australia to open up their Strategic Petroleum Reserves. If we lose just 10%, 2 million barrels a day, it will be chaos, neighbor against neighbor, and there is no plan, and none is even being discussed. What they will do is they will say, oh, well, we just found uh, oil at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Will that relieve the pain at the pump? That's 10 years away. Will cost the equivalent of $400 a barrel to get it out. You know, getting out the barrel, getting out oil from this far on, uh, under the ground and 10 miles down the Gulf of Mexico is two different types of prices. This university, why isn't this university using alternative fuels? Why aren't they using electric vehicles? Why aren't they using batteries? Well, they're going to lie to you and say, well, there's no range. Range, the average car in the United States goes 25 miles a day. 75% of the vehicles go 35 miles a day. They can take a charge. They can get CNG. They can do conversion for 34 for $3,400 for $3,000, and yet we have a program like Cash for Clunkers, which took billions and put them into internal combustion, which no provision, no provision whatsoever for alternative fuels. And so, we have to ask ourselves, can we choose our history? No, we can't. Can we choose our future? Yes, we can. And that is the message of these two books, Internal Combustion and the, and the Plan. If you're concerned about terrorism and who's funding terrorism, I'm funding terrorism. I did. 
I drove here from the Endicott Visitors Center. You're funding terrorism. We're funding it on the mileage plan. Every mile, the money goes to the Persian Gulf. That money is used in part to fund causes against the United States. In the case of Iran, the money was diverted to, uh, 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 large amounts of money were diverted to Pakistan, where AQ Khan gave the nuclear technology to China, which went to North Korea, which created uh, no dong missiles, which were re-tagged Shahab missiles and sent over to Iran. Every day, Iran is saying, we are going to close the Strait of Hormuz if Israel attacks or if we think Israel is going to attack. Israel is going to attack. Are they going to attack now? I don't know. If they're going to attack tomorrow, I don't know. Those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. But at some point, the chances are profound that there will be an oil interruption. And there is no plan. Get off of oil. Challenge what you hear. And as I say, you can't choose your history, but you can choose your future. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm going to take questions about any form of fuel, energy, history. Uh, you could even ask me about some of my other books. How was I received at Endicott by the IBMers? I think I had almost unanimous um, uh, support uh, for my uh, lecture about IBM and the Holocaust, including um, uh, bulletproof documents, uh, except for one guy who thought that a capitalist should be able to do anything and everything. So that went well. This is not a new idea. When they originally had the electric taxis back in 1901, 1899, 1902, the taxis would roll over a small bay. It, 70 seconds later, they would pull out the old battery, put in a new battery. There was no gas stations, of course, at that time. There was no oil use at that time for a large measure for transportation pur uh, purposes. So that's a, that, that's a no-brainer. Thomas Edison also came up with a, uh, a, a parking meter manufactured by General Electric called the Electrant. You'll see a picture of it in my book, Internal Combustion. It was in 1911. You would, um, like, uh, I parked in front of a meter here. You park in front of the meter, plug your car in, and you're recharging while you're out doing your business. This does not take rocket science. This is old stuff, and we, and we can do this now. Okay, there's a bunch of ways to make electricity. First thing, if you want to tell if somebody's lying to you, listen to that word infrastructure. If they say, we can't have electric cars because there's no infrastructure, you know they're lying. We've already got, do you have oven gas here in Binghamton? Oven gas. Do your, gas, do your, uh, do your ovens work on gas? Oh, Fine. If you've got oven gas anywhere in the United States, you can do a CNG car. You got an electrical outlet anywhere in the United States, you can do an electric car. We don't need an infrastructure for that. Now you can generate the electricity in several ways. Bacterially, through uh, um, generation, you can also do it through home recharging stations. I'll give you uh, uh, in, uh, in a, an example. The Honda home energy system uh, was designed, or um, they actually have two, the Honda home en energy system and the Honda uh, um, Re, the Honda refueler would uh, take CNG and, or, or, uh, um, and either crack it into hydrogen or CNG and put it right into a car. But Honda keeps this technology away from uh, consumers. They have it in Japan, but they won't let us have it. And so consequently, there are, are many ways to do electricity. Remember, a hydrogen car is just an electric car. Let me tell you what I did some time back. GM, which now wants me to think they're good guys, gave me a hydrogen car for a week to run in Los Angeles. I pulled my hydrogen car up to the Shell station on Santa Monica Boulevard, a regular Shell station. Up on top of the bay was water. Water. They zapped it with electricity. 
Out came hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas went into the hydrogen tank. The hydrogen, we started the car. The hydrogen gas mixed with the air. It made electricity. It moved the tires. There was no engine, very few moving parts, and it was all based on water. No one got killed. There was no war. No one got invaded. And no one had to dig some black crap out of the desert and drag it halfway across the globe over the dead bodies of Americans so you can go to the 7-Eleven around the corner. That water apparently is too easy. Water. Not with an experimental car. I drove a Chevy Equinox. And the interesting thing is it was a really crappy car. And the reason I'm mentioning that is it just goes to show you don't have to have a million dollar Honda hydrogen fuel cell. You can make a hydrogen fuel cell even in a crappy car. Remember, the German Navy has got uh, five submarines running on hydrogen. We have tanks running on, hyd on hydrogen. There's not just one answer. Ethanol. When I say ethanol, I don't mean corn, which depletes the aquifers. I'm talking about other forms of, al of alcohol fuels, such as Brazilian ethanol. Brazilian ethanol is made reasonably without the environmental problems that corn ethanol gives you. But Brazilian ethanol uh, is taxed at the rate of 54 cents per gallon, while corn ethanol gets a government subsidy arranging to millions and millions of dollars of 51 cents a gallon. Now here's how it works. You want to see recycling in action? Agriculture department gives government subsidies to agribusiness. Agribusiness takes the money and donates it to politicians. Politicians pass laws and, and otherwise makes the government give the subsidies back to these uh, uh, agribusiness concerns, and that is recycling and quite green. What do I suggest? Sit back and wait for the crisis. Nothing's going to happen. Right, I'm telling you, look, I've been, talk, I've been all over the country on this. This is what's going hap to hap happen. You can fax your congressman a letter, he don't care. You can write a letter to the editor, they don't care. The knife is at our throat, and we don't care. When the knife goes into the throat and the blood is spurting, when we have a situation like we did about a year ago, when people in Georgia had to drive 90, uh, when the hurricane hit and the infrastructure was taken down and they had no gasoline, they had to wait, they had to drive 90 miles and wait about 90 minutes to get a tank of gas, then people are going to be upset. Imagine a, a Hurricane Katrina in every city. What will happen? Nothing will happen. But if you have a copy of the plan, either from the library, from Barnes & Noble, or from your buddy, you will be one day ahead. That's why the subtitle of the plan is um, uh, what to do when the oil stops or perhaps the day before. Do we have to wait until we shoot each other for gasoline? Or could we not start this now? Who else has a question? Sir, again. Who? Pickens? T Boom Pickens. Well, I didn't know you could actually run a car on a windmill. But. Uh, infrastructure, right. Well, it takes a lot of electricity to break down that water into hydrogen. Where's it coming from? Okay, so the question is where is the electricity coming down to break down the hydrogen? I talked to the guys who actually invented uh, some of the terminology in this field. They said, if we put a million electric cars on the road right now, it will not equal the additional electrical drain of uh, flat screen TVs. In fact, there's a million, there's enough hydrogen flowing through our country right now in pipes, right now in pipes, to fuel a million hydrogen cars. Why? Guess what? Can't have un unleaded fuel without mixing it with hydrogen. It's all over the place. You'll see it running up and down in, in, uh, with trucks. There are numerous companies that do it, and there are hydrogen pipelines. 
We have the infrastructure. Now it's true, there may not be a 7-Eleven attached to it, but we have the means to tap in to CNG. And frankly, you've got CNG coming to this area in a very big way, and I would simply demand, like they are in Utah, that CNG be a transportation standard in this country, either through conversion or uh, manufacture of original cars. Now there's a catch to this. Get ready for this. It's against the law to convert your car to CNG from oil without a special permit from the EPA, and that's a $50,000 deal. Tampering with a federal fuel emission device. So right now there's an underground movement in Utah and they're not selling weed, and they're not selling child pornography. They are, tr they are getting off of oil, and they have to do it in the shadows because this government has rigged it. So if you just try to switch your own car out, you're committing a federal offense. Who else has a question? It's all in the plan. Who else has a question? Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think about algae fuel? Algae fuel? Great. I can't wait. Um, Algae fuel and other forms of, bac of bacterial fuel are the coming thing, They're, um, but they don't have the yields up to where they need to be, and we don't have enough uh, algae farms yet going. But bacterial, whether it's algae or not, bacterial fuel is the way distant uh, uh, fuel of the future. All the, f all the fuels that I have discussed, hydrogen, First hydrogen bus, 1934. First hydrogen tractor, Alice Chambers, 1954. F first hydrogen van, General Motors, 1956. This is old technology. First, um, uh, uh, the first electric cars, I said, 1835. Uh, but algae is something new, and we need to develop it. And I would be very interested in that. As the world improves, as it must, as poverty is and starvation is addressed, as we must, as the world modernizes, as it must, as people have more access to modern society, as they must, we are adding the need for transportation, for generation, and this is coming. Uh, this is uh, uh, using oil, but it doesn't have to use oil. Uh, as far as demand goes, hey, uh, there are 40,000 Federal Express uh, trucks uh, running around on gasoline. They convert a couple of dozen and they have a giant press release. There's 80,000 UPS vehicles. There are hundreds of thousands of government vehicles, including the post office. There are 110,000 taxis in the United States of America with a three-year scrappage rate. There's demand. We just had cash for clunkers. That's demand. Vehicles have a life expectancy. And we can, my book, The Plan, talks about sidelining cars. That's right. If you have a vehicle that is getting eight to 10 miles per gallon, you will not be allowed to drive it until you convert. If your vehicle is getting up to 25 miles a gallon, you'll be able to go once or twice a week until people convert. There's mustering of transportation. How would you get to school? There would be muster points for the students. How would the, um, uh, there would be odd and, uh, and even days. Uh, but uh, you could drive a Hummer, as long as it wasn't a petroleum Hummer, if it was a hydrogen Hummer like uh, Schwarzenegger had. So you could keep on hum humming, keep on navigating, and keep on escalating as long as you got off of oil. Is there enough energy in the world to support, this guy was talking about uh, India, uh, the Tata is going to be like a $1,500 internal combustion machine. Is there enough energy in the world to support our rapid, continuous industrialization where emerging economies like Brazil and Venezuela and China and India are now leading the way? The answer is, if we do it right, 
Absolutely. If we do it wrong, no. And there will be a war to solve that problem if we do it wrong. And we've proven that we can war for oil decade after decade after decade.